Hello, I'm Professor Dwight Hughes for Clark College's InTech program. This is InTech 222, Routing and Switching Essentials, Chapter 2, Static Routing. Today we're going to look at implementation of static routing, looking at the advantages and disadvantages, talk about the purpose of static routes and different types of static routes, then we'll spend some time configuring various static and default routes and finish up with some troubleshooting. There are two ways you can do routing on a router. One is manually by implementing static routes. You would go into each router and implicitly tell it where each and every destination is. So in router one, you would have to tell it where the internet is and where PC3 and PC4 networks reside. Router one would already know about its directly connected networks. With dynamic routing, router one would learn this information automatically from router two using a dynamic routing protocol. We'll be looking at dynamic routing protocols in our next chapter. Why use static routing? Sounds harder, right? Well, static routes are not advertised over the network, so they result in better security. Unlike dynamic routing, which sends route information across the network, it can be compromised uh, by hackers, so it is less secure, where static routes are just what they are. Whatever you type into the device is what the device will use. They use less bandwidth because no, no uh, updates need to be sent and no communication with the other routers is necessary. You just manually provide them with all the information they need. Also, they use less CPU, so uh, if you had a router that was um, you know, older, didn't have as much CPU, maybe a $50 to $80 router, then uh, manual routes or static routes are preferred. And also the path a static route uses is known. We can document it, we can troubleshoot it, we know exactly where that data is going, where with dynamic routes it can change its mind from moment to moment as it uh, decides on the best path. So dynamic routing is much more challenging from a troubleshooting standpoint. So some use cases where we might use static routes. We use static routes quite often in smaller networks that don't undergo a lot of change. It's pretty much a static network, so static routes are appropriate. There's only a few destinations to tell each router about, and usually there's only one or two ways to get there, so it's a very simple topology. Also, we use static routes quite frequently with stub networks. A stub network is kind of like a cul-de-sac if you're driving on a road. When you drive into a cul-de-sac, the only way out is to just turn around and drive back out the way you came. So a cul-de-sac in a um, network is called a stub network, and it has only one way in, and it's the same way back out. So you can see that router one in this diagram is a stub router, because if you pass from the internet through router one, you are at a dead end. And so if you weren't trying to get to switch one or PC one, you have to turn around and go back out. So we often use static routes for those very simple parts of the network. We also always use a special static route called a default route to represent the path to the internet. That is um, sometimes called the uh, route of last resort. And it's the route that's followed if there's no other match in the um, routing table. So this just highlights some of those. We can use it to connect to specific networks. We can use it as a gateway of last resort or for stub networks. We can reduce the number of routes advertised by doing manual summarization. So we can take several routes, several destinations, and we can look at them in binary and find the binary pattern so we can summarize those. Um, we call that supernetting sometimes, and we can create a manual summarization that provides one path to various places. We'll be looking at doing that. You did some of that in your Intech 103 IP subnetting course. We also can use it to create a backup route in case a primary route fails. We could, for instance, for critical parts of the network, we could create static routes to get there in case dynamic routing fails. A standard static route. There's your stub router, there's your stub network. So if we go into router two, 
there's no need to use dynamic routing to talk to router one because there's only one way in and out. So why have router one and router two chew up bandwidth and CPU cycles, uh, maintaining a dynamic routing protocol that's always looking for better ways to get there when there is only one way. So instead, this would be a perfect situation to use a static route. Typically in this case, we would use on router one what's called a default static route that says send all traffic here. And this is because the default route is used to point to the internet. So in the case of router one, there was only one direction to travel and that would be towards router two with any packet, no matter what. Remember that the directly connected network, well, PC one and switch one are already taken care of in the routing table. So we're talking about any additional traffic beyond those. Using one summary static route. So here is an example of using route summarization or why I alluded to earlier as supernetting, where you can look in binary at the 1720, 1721, 1722, and 1723 networks. And all three of those can be, sorry, four of those networks can be looked at in binary and find that they all have in common 1720 slash 14. The first 14 bits of those 16 bit network IDs are in common. And so we can write that as a single summary route for router one, instead of having four routes, we only have one. Because those four destinations notice are all the same direction. So it's appropriate to just summarize them into a single um, destination. We can use them to create a backup route. So if a link fails, we have another path that can be taken. This is often done with things like a, uh, a dial-up modem, where we wouldn't want to use it under normal circumstances. They're slow, they take a long time to connect. There's so many reasons not to use a dial-up modem, but hey, if you have no network, I'll take a dial-up, right? At least you can get some packets through. So that would be the idea. If you had two different ways in this example, you could send things over the internet or through your private WAN. So you'd prefer to use the private WAN, but if the private WAN goes down, having a backup route that directs it how to get to the same destination across the internet could be useful as a backup. All right, let's start configuring some of these things. All of what we talked about in section one, we're gonna go through and configure for both IPv4 and IPv6. Ready? The command is simple. The static route command, no matter what you're doing, whether you're doing a uh, route for a default network or you're doing a route summarization, it starts with the command IP space route. And then we're going to provide the destination network address and the mask. And then the third piece of information is either the exit interface or the next hop IP address. The next hop can be identified as an IP address, an exit interface, or both. If we provide both, that's called a fully specified static route, where we're not only providing the exit interface, like S001, but we are also providing the next top IP address of the next closest router out that interface. This would be an example of using that next top address. Notice here on router one, we are providing three routes to our three destinations because PC2 is a destination we need to reach, PC3 is a destination we need to reach, and the serial link between router two and router three is also a destination we need to reach. So we need three static routes. Those are our three remote networks. So router one doesn't have to worry about the serial link between router one and router two, that's already directly connected, and also PC1 is directly connected. So we use the IP route command, then we use the network ID for the destination. So the first one is 172.16.10. Then we use the mask of that destination, and then we tell it what next top address. In this case, it's the serial 000 interface on router two. We could have done the same thing in this example with the exit interface. Notice here, instead of providing the 172.16.22, we are providing the serial 000, which is router one's exit interface. So instead of providing router two's next hop interface, we can provide 
Router 1's exit interface. You can do either of those with static routes. Fully specified, which is actually not shown here in the slide, um, would provide both. So after you put the S000, which is the exit interface, you would also type 172.16.2.2. And that would create a fully specified static route. Verify a static route. So we can use some various commands here to verify our static route. The show IP route static will list just static routes. We could do show IP route in a specific route to verify that that specific destination is in the routing table. We could also use the running config or we could just type show IP route and we would see the whole routing table. The reason for showing you a variety of different ways to look at your routing table is routing tables can become quite large. And so it's helpful to learn how to filter the table to just what you're looking for. Otherwise you can end up missing, overlooking something. Let's talk about the default static route. This is a special static route which is used to point towards the internet, or if you will, the outside world, something outside your own network. Within your network, you should know all the destinations. This is the route of the unknown. This tells where to send packets that don't match any other route. That's why it's sometimes called the route of last resort. So this route of last resort or default route is always zero 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 and that would be the destination network and destination mask so that's any destination matches this and then where to send it either the ip address or the exit interface or both and again this route will be the last one the router considers because it matches absolutely any packet it is always the last one looked at. Any other route would trump this route. This route is going to have the lowest um, uh, you know, applicability. The router is going to look at every other route first. This is how you might do it. So in this case, instead of those three routes to get to PC2 and PC3 and the serial link between two and three, I could have just typed a quad zero route as 0000000001721622 which would be router two's next top interface for router one. And I could leave it at that one single default route. And that would send absolutely anything to router two, even things that don't end up having a destination. This would allow me, for instance, to ping some made up destination like 10.10.10.10, which doesn't exist in this topology. If I was at PC one and I sent that ping, it would actually get forwarded by router one, given that you have this default route. It would forward it onto router two. And then assuming router two does not have a default route, it would die there at router two. So you want to be careful with default routes because they can end up forwarding um, junk, traffic that really has no destination. And you want to generally not do that. In this closed network where there's no outside world, we typically wouldn't see a default route used. We're doing it here just as an example. You'll notice that if you do set a default route, it will show up with a special command at the end of your routing table. It will say gateway of last resort. And it tells you that the unknown network 0000 is reachable through 172.16.2.2. That is because of that um, default route that you entered. And you'll see that there's an S because it's a static route, but with the asterisk, which means it's a candidate for a default route. Okay, now we can do the same thing with IPv6. The command is literally the same. You just add a V6 at the end of IP, so it's IPv6 route. It's literally the same, so this information is identical. And this is how it would look. You type IPv6 route, and it's the same network, but with IPv6 interfaces. And I would just choose the destination network for PC2, in this case, 2001 colon DB8 colon ACAD colon two colon colon slash 64. That's my destination network and mask. And then I would provide the next top interface of router two. This is how you do it using the exit interface. And this would be fully qualified or specified. 
In this case, uh, we're using the FE80. If you remember from your NTEC 103 class, FE80 is the link local address. So each router has a link local. You actually could have done that back here in this step as well. Instead of using the global address for router two, which is what was used, it used 2001 DB8 ACAD4 colon colon two, which is the IPv6 address on the serial 000 interface, which is the global IPv6 address. We could have used the link local address on the serial 000 interface, as was done here. So you can use either one. Link locals are sometimes used more often because they're always there. So even if you haven't specified a global IPv6 address, just by making an interface IPv6, it, it instantly and immediately gets a link local. Link local is always there. Okay, in addition to doing ping and traceroute to verify that this works, you could take a look at the routing table. Now we're going to take a look at doing the default route using IPv6. It's exactly the same, except you don't have to type all those zeros. We can replace them with a double colon. So we simply type IPv6 space route space colon colon slash zero. And that would be a all zero network with a zero mask. And then you provide the next top IP you want to go to. And remember that could be the global IP as shown here or the link local IP. And if we wanted it to uh, be different, we could use the exit interface. Instead of that next top IP, we could have provided the S000. Floating static routes. So this is the third concept that we uh, talked about is the idea of a backup route. And so a backup route floats, meaning that it isn't the go-to route, it's the backup. It is not the preferred route. It becomes preferred when the um, primary route is no longer available. The way we do this is by changing its administrative distance, its AD. And if you recall, the AD or administrative distance is the trustworthiness of the route information. We learned that last chapter. So the AD of static routes normally is one. A directly connected route is zero and all the other routes are a higher AD. Well, if we up the AD on a particular static route by manually changing its AD and making it worse like 255, it will be less attractive to the router than routes that have a lower AD. In this example, we have two static routes. Notice that one has a five at the end that's setting its AD as five. That means it will, it will be secondary to other static routes. So you could actually have two static routes to the same destination and have one of them take precedence over the other. In this case, these are default routes. So we're saying that we would prefer to use the default route to router two over the default route to router three because the five on the end makes the second route a AD of five. And remember the default for static, so the first static route would have an AD of one. An AD of one is more trustworthy and would be used before considering higher AD routes. Then we need to test our floating route by trace routing. Trace route's really the only way to do this because ping doesn't tell you what path your packet takes. Traceroute is going to tell me what hops it goes through. So it's going to verify that it is still going to router two and not going to router three. Then I can pull the cable or shut down the interface going to router two. And I can see that the next time I do traceroute, it is in fact rerouted through router three. Okay, a host route is simply a route to an individual host. So you're going to, instead of providing the destination network, type in the IP address of a device. So you can make a route to a specific device and that's called a host route. And you can see that for directly connected networks, and we talked about this last chapter in chapter one, the L is providing the actual IP address of those links where the C is providing your um, network ID. 
So here's a static route going directly to the server. So on the branch router, we're telling it to go to the ISP router by going out the serial 000 port every time it wants to go to that server. So we can use routes to reach a whole group of devices by using the network ID, or we can use the route more restrictively if we only wanted to go there if we were going for specific devices and not for others that might be out there. So we could actually have a route that works for this server, but for some other device in that network, you wouldn't be able to get there from the branch router. So this gives you very granular control over your routing. We can remove a route by putting no in front of it. I usually just do a show run and then type no and then cut and paste the command back in. Nice quick way to pull a route out and it will remove the route for you. In this case, we're doing the same route, but we're doing it fully qualified. So we're using the exit interface and the next top IP. And in this case, we're using the link local address for the next top IP. Finally, our third and last section, we'll talk about troubleshooting static routes. Here's that same simple network that we've been using. So if you're going to troubleshoot, we would probably start with the ping command. But you may not have used the ping command with the source parameter. So you'll notice in the example, we're typing ping to a destination on the network, but we are sourcing it from a particular interface, in this case, the G00 interface. And so you can type ping 192.168.21, which is the destination. That's going to be the um, router 2 serial 001 interface and we are sourcing that from our G00 interface. Because if we don't provide source, it will source it from the closest interface, which would be S000, which means that the ping wouldn't actually route through Router1's routing table. So to be able to test Router1's routing table, we needed to come in um, the gigabit interface. So we need to have it, ideally we would use PC1, but let's say you're in a situation where you don't have access to PC1, you could actually force a ping packet to route through your router by telling it to use an interface that is not the one it's going to go out. So that forces it to come in and get routed in the routing table and then forwarded out the right interface. And that would be the purpose of using the source parameter. We also have some show commands and trace routes always very useful when you're looking at routing. In this network, trace route is less useful because you only have one path to get there. So if the ping is successful, I can tell you absolutely how it got there. But if you had more than one route, it's very helpful to look at trace route. Also trace route, if we had more than one path, can help us detect loops where we might have a packet that does not take a uh, really normal path to get to a destination. It may take a very odd path and we can detect that using trace route. Also, if the ping were to fail, we would need to revert to traceroute anyways to find out where it failed, which router along the path, which hop was the last router to see the packet before it failed. And that would be the first place we would want to start troubleshooting our network. Thank you. We'll see you next week for chapter three.